Chapter 13, Overt Acts, October 1998. Spookio was hyped up, the adrenaline making his heart race and his thoughts impatient. Being jammed into this crowded living room didn't soothe his anxiety. He was ready to move. These brothers, yeah, they earned their respect, but all they did was hang around and tell stories about the old days. He did not want to wait one more night. He'd been ready for weeks to put in work for the cause, and he was ready to get this done. Serving as the gunner for these hits would earn him the right to be pulled, to become a familiano for life. He interrupted Rico as the man was going on about some case he beat, something to do with the prison phone call and trying to hit Pablo. Let's do this thing, Spookio said, right now, huh? Rico paused his war story and considered the young man. The homie had balls, cutting him off like that. These youngsters were something else, and yet Rico understood and shared Spookio's eagerness. Rather than reprimanding the young homie for speaking out of turn, Rico agreed that, despite the appeal of whacking their target in Lobo's mask on Halloween, tonight was the night. He ended his tale and got right to logistics. Each car would have a walkie-talkie. They'd keep close and radio each other if the cops followed. You're going with homie, Rico told Mo, but homie is going to have the strap. I'm going to have the strap, Spookio agreed. And so the plan was this. After Mo gave the go-ahead, Spookio would knock. And when Copas answered, Spookio would shoot him. If Copas wasn't at the door, Spookio would force his way in and lay everybody down until he found the motherfucker. Mo sounded confused by this simple plan, but in fact, he wanted the words on the FBI's tape to come across clearly. With the crew now determined to do this thing tonight, he had to make sure the agents heard everything right. Lives depended on it. Who's carrying the strap, Mo asked. I am, homie. I'm the one who's going to whack him, homie, Spookio explained. They laughed, and this encouraged Spookio, who continued. I'm going to be the one to shoot him. I'm serious. I'm going to be one whacking him, homie. Damn, as wires went, it didn't get any better than this. Lobo's homeboy Greg was on the way over with the gun. Chente asked Spookio if he was sure it would come unloaded. Spookio said, of course. Chente laughed. He didn't want you to turn around and put one in him. The day before, Spookio had met Greg at a theater, and the guy acted like he was sure Spookio was there to kill him. That was why he'd give Spookio an unloaded gun tonight. Some of the others cracked up too, but Spookio's silence made it known he was serious about his job. At 20 years old, he might have been a youngster, but life had put him through a lot. At 20 years old, he might have been a youngster, but life had put him through a lot. And he was as seasoned as Carnales twice his age. Hurry up, Rico shouted out the door as a crew member left to pick up the sweats, shoes, and ski masks, the items the FBI had photographed the day before from another safe pad. The men planned to layer their clothes so that if it went down, they'd peel off the sweats and no one could identify them. Those closest to the action would change into clean jeans afterward so they weren't walking around soaked in blood and bone splatter. The need to change clothes, however, presented a serious problem. What if the guy saw Moe's wire? He had to avoid undressing in front of the others at any cost. Everyone was ready to rehearse now except the homie Kermit. He was off in his own world, yelling into his cell phone, where? Well, you, Laura, hey, tell me where, I can't, I've got to do something right now. Jesus, the last thing anyone needed on a night like this was female trouble, but strangely, they all had it. Spookio was fighting big time with his daughter's mom. Fish, Chante, and Philip all had problems with their women that day. Spookio wondered if something was in the air. The men tried to forget the hyenas and focus on the job. Chente was curious about the two guns Greg had just delivered. Spookio had a 45 semi-automatic and a revolver to choose from. Are you going to choose both of them or just one? Chente asked while Spookio tried to figure out how many rounds fit in the 45. There were eight. Spookio pulled the mag and shoved it back with a loud clap. The more experienced Chente didn't like that weapon and offered some friendly advice. You're better off using a revolver, he said. Rico joined in, agreeing on that finer point of warfare. The revolver is always better because fucking they don't jam, eh? Plus, the shells don't drop, he said. A day earlier, Rico's original inspiration had been to spray the full copas with AK-47s and leave the rifles on the ground, but that particular plan was abandoned for lack of weaponry. 
It was just as well because leaving the weapons, though it made an excellent statement, was rash. Chetty reminded everyone to follow protocol, something too many homeboys were getting careless about these days. He went over the rules. We're going to get rid of the guns, eh? Rico turned his attention to Mo. You gonna see if he's there? And I'm going to give you a radio walkie-talkie. What if he asks for my name? What do I say, Mo? No, no, Chente said. Check this out, check this out. If he's there, tell him that Rico sent you. Rico agreed that was a fine idea. The guy wasn't going to live to tell anyone anyway. A car horn honk. The supplies were here. As a homeboy carried in the bags, they all gathered in close to argue about the driving directions. Though most of them were born and raised in Salinas, no one could agree on how to get to their Mark's house because it was in that new park. It took another 20 minutes to draw maps and get everyone on the same page as far as which way the entrance faced or which side made best for the approach. The ever diligent Chante, who of course had the foresight to scope it out, told them that the pad was exactly 10 houses from the corner. Mo had to wonder whether any of this dialogue was picked up by the FBI. With homeboys on all sides of him, there was no way he could risk calling Agent Martinez on his cell phone. The constant high decibel racket in the room wasn't reassuring. Who knew what, if anything, the cops could make out behind the chatter. Almost immediately it was obvious to those in the listening room that Mo's transmission signal was bad, really bad. A few times it had dropped out entirely and who knew if it would hold through the night. If Mo got into trouble, there was a solid chance they might miss it. At this particular moment, Agents Martinez and Alvarez and the Salinas officers could only hear a scratchy police scanner, guys shouting like drunks at a prize fight and lots of bad static. The transmitters picked up something about copas, but the rest of the phrase was drowned out by the mob's cacophony. Then a sentence came through, it is going to be hot, it is going to be like New Jersey someone was yelling. Whoever said it might have been right, if five hits really went down in one evening, the act would tell the entire country that the NF was as pitiless as any legendary mob family. There was no doubt that this night would live in infamy. The Salinas police officers were certain, of course, that the hits were not going to go down. Not one of them. Not in their town and not on their watch. The FBI agents, however, couldn't be so sure. The crew pulled black sweatsuits and beanies out of a shopping bag. Mo did his best to stay on the sidelines. If anyone saw his transmitter, there was no way in the world he'd leave the apartment alive. No way. No, we ain't going to buy you shoes, dude, Rico yelled at Spookio. That is $45 worth of shit in there, eh? At issue was the fact that Spookio's feet were too big for the shoes Chachi bought, and he couldn't wear his own because the treads could be traced by the cops. It was suggested he put plastic over them. Phillips said duct tape works best because you want something you can run fast in. That prompted Chachi to look at Spookio who was not a small guy and crack up. It don't matter if you have fucking bare feet. You ain't gonna run so fast, he said. Indignant, Spookio reminded Chachi that he ran hella fast the night before he bolted from Chente's truck. Spookio sure didn't want to have to throw out his new sneakers. He dressed real nice that evening to the point where he and his girl fought about it because she assumed it meant he was going out on her. He told Chachi his fucking shoes cost 90 bucks and were very comfortable. Yeah, but they look like shit, Chachi replied. The crew continued joking with the carefree air of young men headed to a party while they passed around the gloves, beanie, sweats, and shoes. Fish asked what everyone was doing for Halloween. Mo did his best to sound casual as others removed their shirts and pulled on sweaters. He mentioned that some friends were hitting a club in San Jose. His sisters planned to dress as that TV goth chick Elvira and another homegirl was going as a mermaid. She has the body for it, Fish said with an appreciative smile. Mo took a moment to examine the ski mask. He asked if the guys bought them at the family bargain center. Fuck that, Chente they said. We got them at fucking Macy's, eh? It brought a laugh that eased the tension that hummed under the surface of their banner. Mo was aware he could be made at any moment. The others were, of course, nervous because they were about to pull off the hits of the decade. Their mission was NF history in the making, a night Norteño kids everywhere would recount in whispers of awe for years. 
Spookyo inspected his cuete and was about to check the trigger when he noticed there was a round inside. Oh shit, it's loaded, he said. He told me it wasn't, Holmes. Alarmed, Rico nonetheless counseled the youngster with patience. You never believe someone, Holmes, when they say that, eh? He said. You always check for yourself. Mo, who'd been toying with his walkie-talkie, came late to the commotion around the gun. Hey, that shit is loaded, man, he said. Everyone spoke at once. I know it's loaded. Check the bullets again. Take it out and make sure. Those are hollow points, huh? That's a police gun, Holmes. That's a straight-up police gun right there. The commotion was awful for the transmission, but Mo couldn't do a damn thing about it. It was the way his crew rolled. Chaos Incorporated. Too many things happening simultaneously, and who knew if the agents could follow any of it? You had Kermit urgently checking his pager for signs of appeasement from his girl, while Spookio pulled rounds from his revolver, the cylinder spinning, the hammer slamming. You had Chente loading two hollow points at the top, so they'd be first to come out, and they'd mushroom inside the body, so the fuckers would explode from the inside out. Fish was bellowing, it's a double action, Holmes. So you just get it, just load it up, spin it. And your first shot is just going to go pow, 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 pow. <laughs> you had Mo forgetting the address and Rico saying for the hundredth time, 1352 Palmera. 